In this lesson, we're looking at allele frequency and extinction. We are covering this point in particular, and we'll manage our very last one during class. So we've learned about the full gamut of evolution, right? From the changing of allele frequencies in a population due to selection pressures, that's seen in microevolution. We're then talking about the ways that new species arise from the gene pool of a population when it's isolated, and the broader patterns that species follows when they are adapting to their ever-changing environment. But what happens when an environment changes so much just around the organism in that habitat that the habitat actually becomes unsuitable? Now entire populations can die out and leave no direct descendants, and this is known as extinction. So extinctions occur through a number of natural ways. It might just be competition between species, it might be changes in the abiotic factors within an environment, particularly as climate change uh, occurs. Essentially the selection pressure becomes so great that there's no phenotype in the population that is biologically fit enough to survive. So they eventually die out and they open up another, uh, another space in the habitat you know, it can be replaced by another organism in that niche that can actually adapt to the change. Now the fossil record shows that nearly all the species that have ever lived on this planet are now extinct. And you know, essentially they are the end of their evolutionary line. So species that are in existence are direct descendants of some ancestral species. So regardless of whether that particular ancestor is present or no longer around, there's been some type of transformation that has occurred as the adaptation to the environment occurred. So extinct species, on the other hand, do not undergo any of that transformative adaptation so they die out and they leave no descendants. Species become vulnerable to extinction when their population size decreases and in turn as does their genetic diversity. If their populations are so small, you know, they become less uh, resilient to change in the environment. So if we look at a catastrophic event and natural disasters, there aren't actually too many phenotypes that are going to be able to increase the chances of survival for that population. So those that do survive actually do so by chance. And you know, this can lead to population bottlenecks. Recall that population bottlenecks will significantly and negatively impact the genetic diversity of a population. So the resulting allele frequency isn't going to reflect the actual original population. It's unlikely to carry that full range of alleles. So firstly, with decreased genetic diversity, there's actually a decreased chance of having uh, an allele that is fit for that habitat or whatever that selection pressure is, if a different selection pressure should arise. And secondly, the number of reproductive pairings within the new population is limited. So inbreeding actually occurs and that further decreases the variation. It also increases the possibility that say these recessive homozygous recessive uh, individuals do pop up as well. So after a catastrophic event or a natural disaster that leads to a population bottleneck, alleles can be lost really quickly, almost immediately, or they can just die out with individuals who showed that phenotype. Um, you know, they can be bred out really, really slowly due to inbreeding and just those decreased uh, reproductive pairing opportunities. So it really does leave a new population quite vulnerable to environmental change because it has fewer phenotypes to draw on to survive when new selection pressures appear and they're more uh, vulnerable, therefore, to extinction. The Tasmanian devil population began decreasing during the last ice age and it's thought that through the founders effect they've actually ended up in Tasmania and with an even smaller population now they're isolated, inbreeding occurs, it further decreases that genetic diversity so they sit quite low when we're talking about a number of those single nucleotide polymorphisms which are a measure of that variation. So now unfortunately they suffer from this facial tumour disease. It's a contagious cancer which is quite interesting um, which in affects approximately 80% of the surviving Tasmanian devil population, so quite a substantial number. Because so many of the genes amongst the population are so similar, they actually, you know, we expect that those Tasmanian devils will then respond in a similar way to this disease, which is their selection pressure. Now given it's a fatal disease, so much of the wild Tasmanian devil population has been decimated and there needs to be massive conservation uh, intervention efforts to save them. The Tasmanian tiger, however, is actually extinct, right? It's also known as the thylacine, and it's thought to have become uh, extinct around the 1930s. Now, it was previously an apex predator, and through convergent evolution, had really similar physical features to a tiger or a wolf, and it even had those, you know, the stripes that we see in diagrams. Now, it was a marsupial, 
Uh, so it had a pouch like a kangaroo. And while its population numbers were already, you know, declining before humans arrival 60,000 years ago, so arrival in Australia, we're talking, um, you know, this decline increased rapidly with recent human activities increasing as well. So when colonization occurred, so we're talking things like hunting and also there was competition with the dingo. So it's, you know, there's a lot of different theories about what led to their decline. They went extinct in Papua New Guinea and mainland Australia, and then that really only left them in Tasmania. And even then, they were pretty rare uh, in the wild. And the last known thylacine died in a zoo in Hobart around 1936. That's what's postulated anyway. So recall that our second piece of subject matter here, which is about interpreting gene flow and allele frequency data, um, this is going to require us to do some data analysis and interpretation, obviously. So we'll be applying that further in the classroom. So our main focus in this lesson was that one there.